So I'm here to tell you a secret. And the secret is this. Um, everything you know about the environmental movement, including how to save it, might very well be wrong. But before I tell you why businesses that we basically despise might be a great ally, why kids who we consider iPod idiots might actually start a revolution, and why the one billion or so rural poor who never make it into venues like this, the marginalized and dispossessed people of the world, might hold the key to it all. Before I tell you why that the environmental movement needs a reframe, or a rethink, or an awakening, or a kick in the rear end, I need to tell you a little bit about myself. So I was born on an island. And sometimes I don't tell you what island and make you guess, but it's Sri Lanka. And when I was born, I was born a stone throw away from the Indian Ocean. You could see the ocean from my house. My grandmother, who's the matriarch of the family, took me to see an astrologer, something that they do in Sri Lanka and I think in some other island cultures. But instead of reading my palm, the astrologer read my head, read the hair patterns, what you call cowlicks, or the swirls that you see on a baby's head as the hair grows. So we read that, apparently. So my mother, grandmother had my head read, came back home, and announced to my entire extended family that I would die by drowning. <laughs> so great if you're born over here. <laughs> so my parents did the really sensible thing. While all my other nieces and nephews, cousins, and family members could go out and swim in the ocean and go out to the ocean all the time, I was prevented from doing so. I could only stand on a balcony and look at the ocean um, out there. <laughs> Notice the careful placement of my hands. <laughs> Is this the only picture that they could take of me? Back, back then, you didn't do another picture. You had like one shot, and then you got to keep it for the rest of your life. It's not that long ago. So there I was stuck, and actually that little parapet that you can see, I could actually see the ocean from then. I watched ships disappear over the horizon, and ships come back again, and, and so it went. And that was my condition that I was born into until I was about nine years old, and we moved to Africa. We actually moved earlier than that. But about when I was eight or nine years old, my mother broke with convention and got me swimming lessons. She taught me how to swim. And it's a big deal to do that. I mean, what she did was a very rational strategy. If a kid's going to die of drowning, then keep him out of water is a pretty smart thing to do. Yet she did what I think most of you in this audience would agree. If you thought that your fate was drowning, you would, too, learn how to swim. You would do this contrary thing in order to make, give yourself some chance. And since then, I've gone on to do things like this. This is in the uh, Coral Sea off the coast of northern Australia. And I'm catching sharks here in the non-traditional manner. When I was asked to go catch sharks, I thought it would be like with a hook and a line and the usual sort of stuff. But in Australia, they don't do that. They go and sneak up to them with uh, a, a rope and, and get them by the tail. Um, the hard part is not catching the shark. It's what to do with it once you've caught it. <laughs> Which I'm about to learn here. Now, why I'm telling you the story is because I think that the environmental movement is exactly in this place that I found myself in so long ago. The death of the movement, the death of the environment, the death of the planet has been foretold. Now, what do we do with that information? What are you going to do with that information? This is the way we want the planet to look all the habitat types on Earth, the natural world. It's sort of what we're aiming to create. But it doesn't really look like this. It actually looks sort of like that. And this is basically the human footprint index that Sanderson and others published in Bioscience, and then uh, the Halpern paper in, in Science on the Marine Index, and a few other things, and about 19 factors put in there to show you the extent of agriculture, of coral reef degradation, of damming, um, of uh, deforestation, uh, and human habitation, and so on and so forth. 
So the Earth looks very different from this imaginary view that we want it to look really like. So this is the impact of the planet, on the planet, but the, the, the dividend is all of you. You know, we as a species are very successful species. You guys are all living proofs of that. In every measure we can think of of human well-being and development, humans are doing better on every continent. We're living longer, we send our kids to school more, we have better health care, uh, voting rights, women's rights, whatever you, want to, whatever you care about, we are doing better. But it's come at a cost. And for this one species outside of cyanobacteria, we are really able to transform the planet in this unimaginable way. And despite all the successes that is so apparent to all of us, just all of you sitting here, seven billion of us doing incredibly well on this planet, there are still people out there for whom where they get their water is still a big challenge. The most populous parts of the world have more cell phones than working toilets. Every day about five plane loads of kids crashes basically, uh, if you think about the number of kids who die from simple, preventable, waterborne illnesses. We have people, we, despite all the food we grow, we have people every night who go to bed hungry. So all those successes have come at a big cost and a big price. And of course, I, you know all the stuff that we've done to the natural world, the sixth extinction crisis that E.O. Wilson and others write about, where species that we share this planet with are going away. That's real. We're changing the acidity of the oceans. We're changing the atmosphere. About half of all photosynthetic output of the planet is now used by one species, us. We are fundamentally the biggest contributor to the nitrogen cycle. So basically, everything I can tell you about the planet is, is quite dire and quite bad. And the planet still has the ability, now and then, to reach out and bite us. This is a picture in Bangladesh. Uh, where 17% of the land area is going underwater, and people are flooding into the uh, city of Dhaka, which was really a city built for two or three pe million people, but they're getting about 500,000 people moving in there every year. So you can see the pressures. So despite all our advances, despite our trammeling and our subjugation of the natural world, that natural world still has the ability to rear up now and then and really bite us. So why do, have we got to this point? And why have we in the environmental community, who you have entrusted to do something about all of this, not done a better job of it? Don't get me wrong, there have been successes, and I can tell you lots of those success stories later. But why haven't we done a better job? So my thesis to you is two things. The first is how we frame the argument. I think it was misguided. It has been misguided in the last couple of decades. Um, and I'll tell you when I think it, it changed. And the second is who we count as the people we want to work with in order to really create a movement. So when I was in grad school, this book was on my shelf. It had come out, it was influential, and E.O. Wilson and others introduced this word to us, biodiversity. We hadn't heard that before. Before that, it was like ecology or wildlife. And I didn't want to study biodiversity when I was a kid. I wanted to go study like tigers or lions or, you know, cool things like that. I ended up studying gophers, which is sort of odd. And I actually, as a grad student, had a golden gopher sticker on the bumper of my pickup truck, even though I had no idea what the golden gopher was. <laughs> I got a PhD in this. I got a PhD in gophers. You guys should love me here. <laughs> So there are these two books that came out, and E.O. Wilson brought this concept of biodiversity to us. And what did he really mean by that? He meant these magical, amazing forests that were dripping, that were dripping with life, cathedral-like rainforests and coral reefs, Ma unima unimaginable and magical at the same time. And if you look at these covers, you can see that. Look how beautiful that is, right? I mean, many of you have these books. I mean, look how beautiful that cover is. Um, it's got a water drop there, it's got a whale in there, it's got a toucan and orangutan up there. I mean, it, it really gives you the sense that life is constantly springing um, out of this wellspring of, the, of planet Earth. But obviously, there's something missing from these pictures. Right? All of you. Humans. We, the biggest modifier and the biggest protector of biodiversity, are not really in this image. We're setting up an image of nature out there, like the Sistine Chapel, that is to be looked at and maybe worshipped in, but never messed with, never interfered with. We are separate from it. Now, 
Wilson didn't come up with this on his own. If you go back a little bit further than that, you get Ed Abbey, who really was the icon for people like uh, my own advisor, Michael Soule, and others, who really brought that conservation movement into the forefront um, when we were students. So Ed Abbey writes Desert Solitaire. And when he's writing Desert Solitaire, by the way, He's pretty lonely if you read his personal diaries. He's pining for companionship. Now, frankly, he was pining for companionship of his girlfriend. But nevertheless, he was pretty lonely doing this. And this is the image we have. When we think of nature, what do you think about? You think about something out there, something far away. And when you decide you're going to interact with nature, how do you do it? You kit yourself out, you go out, and you get into wilderness. You unplug. You turn off all your devices. You tell people to leave all that stuff behind. And the people we hold up to are the people who are even more extreme, who are able to get even further into nature and sort of leave everything alone. If you go to an urban park, let's say in California um, or in India or probably even here, and you look at the park and you look at who is using what area of the park, you'll see something very interesting. If you look near the car park, in the, in the lawns, in the meadowy areas, you will see Hispanic families. You'll see Asian families. You'll see families. And you know, when I go through there, frankly, I'm like, you know, it's usually a whole family of Asians. And it's like the grandmother, the grandfather, the uncle, the aunts, the kids, the nieces, the nephews. They're really loud. They're playing music. They're so obnoxious. They have food. You know, and, and you're kind of like, oh, please don't recognize me. I'm just going to walk away. I just am so embarrassed by this whole thing. And then you get on a trail, and you go out there into wilderness, and then you will meet a solitary hiker who's all kitted out in the best Patagonia gear that money can buy. And he kind of looks a little bit angry, and he's got that thousand-yard stare. And you walk past each other think you're really cool, and you kind of nod a little bit and keep going. Right? Who's having more fun, you think? <laughs> who's really enjoying nature? Now, I even though I'm Asian, I was brought up in this other, sort of this other tradition, so I started doing those same things as well. You know, look, I live in Montana, and I live in Montana because I like going out in the woods now and then, knowing full well that there's an animal that is much bigger than me, that has claws and big, sharp teeth that can actually kill me. That kind of makes that walk in the woods really exciting for me, that twig snap, and I'm, you know, and maybe that's back to our evolution. You know, we're not supposed to die getting hit by a school bus on the way to work. We're supposed to get, die by some predator killing us out there, and maybe this all comes back and I feel more alive. But that proposition that go out into nature, it might come out and kill you, works for us in this room, doesn't work for most of the people out in the real world. So that framing of man apart from nature, as it's in the Wilderness Act, man apart from nature, doesn't translate really well to the masses. Works for you and I, doesn't work for the big group. Now let's go to how conservation looks like today. So this is a picture of an animal called the northern white rhino. It's one of the rarest animals on the planet. There's only eight of these animals left. Eight in the whole world. Not southern whites, the northern whites. Even when Theodore Roosevelt went looking for these to hunt for the American Museum of Natural History side project, he didn't find very many of these, even back then, right? And of these eight, all of them were basically in a zoo. Six were in the zoo in the Czech Republic, as this one is, and two are in the San Diego Zoo. This one's name is Sudan. Sudan was about three months old when he was caught from southern Sudan and then moved to an uh, Eastern European zoo where he refused to breed. No surprise. If you were in an Eastern European zoo, you would refuse to breed too. <laughs> so this species was really not going anywhere. But then last year, in a very much last-ditch effort, spending an enormous amount of money Four of these animals, the last four that people thought might have a chance of still having it in them to breed, were airlifted by DHL, nonetheless, and sent to Kenya. And so this picture is a really rare picture because it's a northern white rhino in Africa. So I'm born free, it's set free, if you will, out into nature to hopefully do its thing. Now the thing is, if you pull back the camera a little bit, this is really what this view looks like, OK? So these guys have to go around following these rhinos day and night, because there's an $80,000 bounty on that rhino's head because of the horn. And if they blink, one of these things will get killed. And it's a real thing. 500 plus rhinos have already been poached from South Africa this year. So it's a real, real issue. Enormous cost at the last minute to save a species from extinction. 
Now, I am not going to argue for or against it. I personally want these things to be saved, and I will go to extraordinary lengths to doing that. But in the general public, that's the way they think about conservation. When they, think, when they hear I'm a tree hugger, when they hear that I'm an environmentalist, when they hear that I care about nature and wild animals, when they hear that I'm a conservationist, when they hear that I work for the Nature Conservatory, <laughs> this is what they think I do. Okay? We need to change that. So I'm going to tell you three simple stories. The first story is about businesses, why they need to be our allies. Businesses who generally environmentalists despise. Second story is going to be about the poor. The poor who we basically ignore. We don't really hate them, but we know they're a problem in the parks, and we just sort of ignore and wish they'd go away. And the youth, who Bill McKibben calls the iPod idiots. Okay. This is a little town called Puerto Lopez. It's on the coast of Ecuador. And if you go there, you'll see a lot of shops like this that serve ceviche and cerveza right there. I went into one of them, and I met the proprietress. It's a woman named Margarita. Real story, her real name is Margarita. Here's Margarita. I asked Margarita, what's the hardest challenge for you as a small business owner running your business? I thought she'd say fish or customers or advertisement or getting a cook or all of that. What do you guess what she said? Agua. Agua. Water. Really? So she takes me in the back and she shows me a tap. And underneath the tap is a pink plastic bucket. And that bucket is waiting for that minor miracle that might happen, once a week maybe, when that tap will actually run. Now she pays the municipal bills, but she doesn't know when that water is going to run. So where does she actually get her water from? Well, she gets her water from this dude. He drives down to a dry river valley called the Arampa River, which is dry, pumps it out, brings it into town, sells it to her for 25 bucks a pop. It's the biggest expense, the biggest uncertainty. This dude has a cold one week. She's, she has to close shop. Now, if you go to the city of Quito, two million strong, if any of you have been to Quito, stay in a hotel, open up the tap, water comes out, day and night. It's clean water, it's cold water, it's pretty good water. How did Quito do it? Quito did it because about a decade ago, with the help of the Nature Conservancy, but it was really the mayor of Quito who did this, they set up a fund, which they imaginatively, imaginatively called a water fund. And the, the water fund does a very simple thing. People who use water, the big bottling companies like FEMSA, the hydro companies, the, the big hotels, the big users of water pay a small tax. That money is pooled and then transferred to communities who live in the upper Andes. And in return for that money, those indigenous communities on the, in the upper Andes, Quechua communities, basically protect the Paramo grasslands. And the more money, the more protection, and that serves like a giant sponge, allowing water to flow into the city. This model is so successful that 30 other cities in Latin America have now bought into this and are creating their own water fund. New York City uses this partly as a way of making its water work. The Conservancy put in money in the beginning, but today this fund generates $900,000, basically a million bucks a year for the Condo Biosphere Reserve. Now, you and I would go to the Condo Biosphere Reserve to see condors. And, and in bears and things like that. But for the community who lives in uh, Quito, it's basically where their water comes from. They don't really care whether they, about the Andean bear or the condo that much. And I don't want to have that argument with them just yet. But that flow of services from one end to the other maintains it. Now, this is a small businesswoman, but the same thing is true for a big business as well. So when we were you know, 20 years ago, if you wanted to think about green business, you'd think about Patagonia. And Patagonia is a great company. I love their products. And we bought it, and we would pay that extra premium to buy it because we wanted to feel cool. We'd wear something that was green, that was good for the earth, and it was also well done. And Patagonia created a niche to do that. Today, it's no longer those niche communities that are doing it. Today, it's mainstream businesses that are doing it as well. Today, it's Coca-Cola and and General Mills, and others who are getting in on the game. Now, why are they getting in on the game? It's no longer for niche differentiation. It's no longer because they want to create a premium. Yes, yeah, some of them do. They put a sticker on a label, but it's really not because of that. It's because, as a colleague from General Mills said to me one time when I was asking him about this, he said, for us, sustainability equals availability. 
Sustainability equals availability. They're doing it because it's in their best interest. If you're a big company and you want to sell to a global audience and you've got seven billion people that you want to service, seven billion people you want to service, you better worry about where your water's coming from. You better worry about what you're doing with your waste. You better worry about where your wood is coming from. Raw, raw natural resources are one of your biggest uncertainties you have to deal with as you think about scaling up. So for once now, big companies are in on the game for a very different reason than you and I might be, but in that I see a strong ally. The second story I want to tell you is about the poor. How many of you have been to the Solomon Islands? Anyone? Solomon Islands, anyone? I always ask this because if no one puts their hand up, you can tell them anything you want. <laughs> it's a simple trick. Okay, Solomon Islands is an amazing place, right? So they're out there in the Pacific, South Pacific, about 100 islands. Um, they only have about half a million people, but they have over 109 language groups, hyper-diversity of language. Jared Diamond and others did a lot of their early work in the Solomon Islands. It's the first place where American soldiers, Marines, met the Japanese ground force. The Guadalcanal Diaries is there. There's a place called Iron Bottom Sound that is littered with the carcasses of World War II wrecks. It's where Kennedy swam, you know, when his PT-109 was, was blown up under him. There's a swim, actually, it's called the Kennedy Mile, and you can swim it. You swim it fast because there are sharks in the water, so you kind of, it motivates you. But he did it with, with someone he was towing, which is kind of amazing to, to think about. Um, it's also the last place that the Japanese surrendered to the Americans. 1967, there was a Japanese soldier who had hidden out on the island, would occasionally come out to spear a pig or sh take a shot, and he was eventually convinced to surrender because they dropped letters from his mother to him from a plane, we're, we're telling him that the war has been over for 20 years. Bottom line, Solomon Islands is a great place to go if you want to get lost. It's also the last haunt of the headhunters of Asia. And the headhunters of Asia, you know, really created this this terrorizing mechanism of keeping communities away from one another because for them it was all about controlling marine resources. So a headhunting boat would come by, people would blow big conch horns, and they would flee to the highlands to escape headhunters. It was just a system of managing this resource in, in this sort of aggressive, terroristic sort of way. Well, that kind of conflict with 109 different languages has continued in today. And a decade or so ago, two communities were basically at open warfare with one another, fighting over a set of islands called the Anrovans. And the Anrovans basically provided fish. In the Solomon Islands, by the way, the unemployment rate is about 80%. But people don't look hungry and they don't look poor because they get virtually everything they want in this informal economy that comes from the ocean. So you can see why that pressure was so strong. Long story short, but a pretty inventive leader came into force, uh, a Solomon Islander by the name of Rudy. And Rudy basically convinced these two communities to set aside their animosity and create a taboo zone. That word tambu, T-A-M-B-U, is a Solomon Island word. It means don't go, danger. A taboo zone between these two communities. And that DMZ, that demilitarized zone, if you will, ended up becoming what you would call a marine protected area, but we call a fish bank. It was a place where fish could grow to large sizes, and people who lived outside of the fish bank would live off the interest that was being provided by the fish. You didn't catch the principle, you just lived off the interest. The little fish that would swim out. Now, that happened 10 years ago. It reduced conflict. Now there's intermarriages between the two communities. But more recently, we went out there and we did, asked a couple of questions. How's nature doing? It turns out that nature is doing pretty well. You can find giant clams now there. You can find sharks. You can find some of the big predatory fish that you rarely see in Pacific waters anymore. So we know that your donation to the Nature Conservancy is being well spent because you're giving us money to save nature. But we also went and looked at 2,200 individuals and asked them, families, and asked them how well they are doing. And here's what we found. In five years, they had doubled their income double their income in five years. We measured it in five different indices, and every one of them showed an increase, and in personal income, doubled. Because they were able to sustainably harvest the fish and diversify. Seaweed farming, they were harvesting a shell that's found no, nowhere in the Pacific anymore, but it's used to make high-end buttons that you might find on a shirt if you went to Savile Row and got, got a really nice shirt, and so on and so forth. 
And so communities were doing a little bit better as well. And that was a really surprising find. This girl I show you here has three sea slugs. And basically having just those three, sli three sea slugs is enough to pay for her school fees for the whole year. The third story I'm going to tell you is about the youth. So this is my niece. She's nine years old. Her name is Apsara. And she likes um, nature, even though her parents want to have nothing to do with it. So to put this in perspective, her mom is into the financial world, my sister. And um, when I told her to come visit me in Montana, which is where I live, I told her we have Four Seasons. And she thought, true story, that I meant the Four Seasons Resort. Okay? <laughs> But the gene went into the kid, and the kid loves nature, and particularly loves marine life. So a couple of years ago, a year ago, I took her to the New England Aquarium. And we get there with uh, my sister, and she has an iPad with her. She goes everywhere with her iPad. And I said, Apsara, leave your iPad behind. We're going into the aquarium. And she said, why? I'm like, well, because, you know, it's now time to go look at fish. Why? Because you might get wet, why? You know, the why, 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 why? And we realized that it's like me telling you, leave your coffee mug behind you going to a lecture. Just didn't make sense. Or leave your guns behind you entering a building, as I saw out here. <laughs> In Montana, that would make no sense. <laughs> it was really weird to her. So we said, fine, bring it in. And what happened was she brought it in. And before I knew it, she had an app that she was communicating directly with the penguins that they have there. And then, during lunch, she had created a little presentation that was basically a presentation of the lead scientist of the Nature's Conservancy, taking her on a behind-the-scenes tour of the aquarium that she then shares with all her classmates. So instead of taking one kid on a, on, a, on a trip through the aquarium, I'm now taking 22. And that, to me, was a real eye-opener. I realized that instead of trying to get kids out into nature, which I by all means support. Our kids today get less time out in nature than maximum security prisoners do. It's true. They're mandated an hour a day, and our kids don't get that. But instead of trying to take kids out into nature, which is very unscalable, by the way. I have to physically do it. I have to bring buses. I have to get liability forms. I can do one better. I can bring a little bit of nature to where they are. I can use digital technology to bring best science and bring best nature into schools. So we just launched a program called Nature Works Everywhere. It's only 10 days old. It's already got 70,000 views in it. And it's done with discovery education. And it uses clever videos and then lesson plans. The lesson plans are important. They go along with it that are you know, up to STEM standards and meet the common core and all of that for you teachers out there. Again, it's to, bring, it's to use the power of technology to mobilize kids to get into the schools, which is where they are, and to bring a little bit of nature into it, not to supplant nature in its glory and magnificence, but to be able to get that into their curriculum so that they, once enabled by technology, can be a force for change. So I hope I've given you a little bit of a picture today, sort of a different way of thinking about the environmental movement, about why I think that the, the, the division between humans and the rest of the planet, between humans and nature, is a division that we need to overcome. You know, to be in nature is to be essentially social. Right? That's the big difference between a frog and the rock it sits upon. The frog croaks. So everything in nature is connected. It's the ultimate social network, if you like. And we do a really good job of making sure that we are unplugged from it instead of thinking about how we can then firmly connect us within it. So reframe the debate so that humans are part of nature. And then reach out to three constituencies that I think we have ignored at our peril. Because with them on our side, now we can really start thinking about creating a real movement. You know, John was right when he said in his opening remarks that we live in a remarkable time on the history of this planet. 200,000 years of Homo sapiens, 4 million years of hominid evolution from the plains of East Africa. There's a place called Laotoli in northern Tanzania. And if you go there, you will see footprints laid out in volcanic ash that were laid by a short hominid about that tall. Actually, there were a pair of them. And they walked on a rainy day. And we can tell it's rainy because you see the little drops of water as well. And it goes for about 70 or 80 feet. And it's crisscrossed by tracks of hyenas and jackals and gazelle. And you can just see all of that life right there. 
and these two hominids, and one of them was probably a female, the prince is smaller, walking with a slight tilt because she may have had a child on her hips, walked down this valley to, as, a, as a volcano exploded and, and covered the land with ash. And as they're walking, there's a moment where they stop, and one of the, both of those um, prints tilt a little bit to the side. It's as if they were on a journey and then they stop for a moment and they look out onto the horizon. And what are they doing? That's the first expression of doubt laid out in stone right there in front of you. What were they looking at? Was it an opportunity? Maybe a dead animal, a carcass they could harvest? Or was it danger, a lion on the horizon? I don't really know. But I do know that as long as we've been bipedal, as long as we've been able to stand up, like me on that window, um, looking out at the ocean. We've always wanted to see a little bit further. But for about four million years, we've been trapped into seeing the planet in very small pixels. A human being out on the prairies can see about seven miles before the curvature of the Earth takes their sight away. And we've had to take all those little pixels and put them together to extrapolate what's over the horizon. And then in one generation, your generation, my generation, our generation, we see the whole shebang. We see the whole thing right there. And it's a wonder that our heads didn't explode in that moment because we've now seen something we've never seen before that we could even process this, the entire planet. Our actions upon the planet, we can no longer turn a blind eye. We can see it. We know what we're doing. We know what we have done. We are no doubt the most fundamental, most important, most opportune generation that's come on this planet. We're the ones, you know, as John said, he's right. 50 years from now, it's going to be too late. 50 years ago, we probably didn't know what we know today. We've come at the right moment. We're going to go down as the biggest losers or the greatest generation. We're the ones who will see the most and have the opportunity to do the most. But only if, with all of your help, we really start swimming. So thank you. Thanks for coming out. Thanks for supporting the Nature Conservancy. And thanks for supporting uh, the Minnesota Institute of the Environment. Thank you.